So welcome to this next video in the playlist on real analysis. In this video, we're going to continue our study of Riemann integration, and we're going to prove the integration by substitution formula. So let's begin with the setup then for integration by substitution. So we're going to consider a function f that is defined over some interval a, b, and is real valued. And one of the assumptions that we're going to need to be true for this function f, for integration by substitution to apply, is it's going to need to be continuous everywhere over that interval a, b. So I've drawn a picture of my function f here. Here's the interval a, b, and this then is graphically representing that function f, and it's continuous everywhere over that interval, which intuitively means that we can draw it without taking our pen off the paper. And we are going to consider the integral of this function over that interval a, b. So the integral from a to b of f of t dt. And of course, this integral is going to exist. The function is going to be integrable over the interval a, b because it's continuous everywhere over that interval a, b. So we know that functions that are continuous everywhere over an interval are then integrable over that interval. So this integral is going to exist. Now the whole idea then of integration by substitution is that we're then going to create another function a function that we'll call g, that is from a second interval, the interval cd, which is what I've drawn here. And this function g is going to map the points on that interval cd into our initial interval, the interval ab. So here's our interval ab, so everything inside here is going to be mapped into here. And then the idea is we're going to find an integral over this interval cd that is then going to equal the integral of interest, this integral of f over the interval a, b. Now in order for this to work, we're going to need a few conditions to hold true for the function g, and the first ones that we're going to make are that the endpoints are mapped onto the endpoints of the interval a, b. So if you look at where c is being mapped to, it's being mapped onto a, and when d is being mapped onto, it's being mapped onto b. So g of c is equal to a, and g of d is equal to b. Those are our first two assumptions about the function g. The next assumption that we need about this function g is that it's what's known as continuously differentiable everywhere over the interval c, d. Now, what does that mean? Well, one, it means that it's differentiable everywhere over the interval c, d. So if you go to any point in the interval, the function g needs to be differentiable at that point. Therefore, the function g prime will be defined for the entire interval c, d, and it will be a real valued function. So differentiability is the first part of continuously differentiable. The second part is that this function g prime needs to actually be continuous. So it, this function, the derivative function, has to be continuous everywhere over that interval cd. That's the second part of continuously differentiable. So if for our function g it is the case that it's differentiable everywhere over the interval cd, and that the function g prime that you get from differentiating is then continuous everywhere over the interval cd, then we say that the initial function g is continuously differentiable over the interval cd. Now note, this is a stronger criterion than just differentiable alone. There are examples of functions where they are differentiable everywhere over an interval such as the interval cd, but when you look at their derivative function, it's not continuous everywhere over that interval. So it is a stronger criterion than just differentiable alone, the fact that the derivative is then continuous everywhere over the interval. And we need not just differentiable, we need continuously differentiable over the entire interval cd. So that's it. Those are the criteria that we need to hold for the function g in order for integration by substitution to work. Now before we go on to prove the integration by substitution formula, I just want to examine this function g and try and gain a bit more intuition for it. And so I have drawn a picture here to help with that. So we know that the function g is mapping from the interval cd into the interval ab. So I've plotted the domain interval on the x-axis and the codomain interval on the y-axis. And then here is graphically representing the g function. So here is the interval cd, our domain, and here is the interval ab, our codomain. And we know that the point c is being mapped onto a, so it's being plotted there, and the point d is being mapped onto the point b, so it's plotted up there. 
Other things we know about this, we know that everything else in between C and D in this interval has to be mapped onto something inside the interval AB, because that's the entire codomain. It cannot be mapped onto something above B, and it cannot be mapped onto something below A. So this graph, therefore, cannot go below this line, this level of A, and it cannot go above this level of B here. So it's got to be something like this. We also know that the function g is continuously differentiable over the entire interval cd. Now, in particular, that means it's differentiable everywhere over that interval cd, and that means it's continuous everywhere over the interval cd. So that means that I can draw it without taking my pen off the piece of paper. And it also means that it's going to obey the intermediate value theorem, which says that if you take any point that's in between a and b, that there must be some point, at least one point, in the interval cd that is being mapped onto it. So because at one end of the interval cd, it's at the level a, and at the other end, it's at the level b, that means that anything in between it, by the intermediate value theorem, has to have some point that is being mapped onto it. So the function has to go through all heights, effectively, when you're uh, drawing it in this way. Now, the crucial thing, the reason I've actually drawn this picture is to show you that the function doesn't need to be injective. Now, because it obeys the intermediate value theorem, it is going to be subjective, so it's going to be onto. Every point inside this interval is going to have one point, at least one point, being mapped onto it. But it doesn't necessarily need to be injective, and therefore it's not overall necessarily going to be bijective. So, I've graphically shown this here. This function most definitely is not injective. It's not one-to-one. -one. If you look at this sort of height here, you can see there's, I think, about five points in our domain being mapped onto that sort of level. And that's absolutely fine. Injectivity is not a criterion. This is necessary for integration by substitution. And the reason I wanted to emphasize this is that's against what my intuition would have been. If I'd had to guess how this was going to work, I would have said that this function needs to be nicer than this, that it has to be a really quite boring function that's bijective. So something maybe like what I'm tracing out now, something like this, where each point in the codomain, the interval AB, has only one point that's being mapped onto it, one and only one point that's being mapped onto it, i.e. that if you think uh, up to this picture here, that it's kind of just, you know, you're mapping this interval onto this interval, and all you're really doing is maybe just stretching bits and squashing other bits, but you're keeping everything kind of in the same order. At no point are you sort of folding back on yourself in the way that this function is doing. You know, it's kind of um, this bit here is sort of being mapped onto up here, and then you're going further forward here and then coming back here. So you're kind of folding, if you imagine this sort of being a, a piece of string, and you're mapping it onto another piece of string, then you're kind of folding the bit of string back on itself over and over again here. I would have thought that you would have had to have a function that doesn't have any of those folds in order for integration by substitution to hold, i.e. that the function would need to be bijective, injective, and subjective. But that's not the case. This function is absolutely perfectly credible for integration by substitution to work. These folds do not stop it working. So as long as the function is continuously differentiable and these bits hold true, then this is going to work. And you're going to see the proof of that now. And nowhere is injectivity going to be a necessary criterion. So that completes the setup. Let's now commence the proof. So we're going to begin with some work on this function f. So remember, we assumed that the function f was continuous everywhere over the interval a, b. Now we're going to apply the first fundamental theorem of calculus to this function f. And remember, the first fundamental theorem of calculus says that such functions, i.e. functions that are continuous over an interval, will have an antiderivative over that interval. And I've written down the formula for the antiderivative over here. So we'll call the antiderivative of little f big f, as is conventional. And it's going to be defined for any x inside that interval a, b. And it's the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So whatever x you take inside this interval, you can perform the integral from a to x of the function f, and you'll get some value, and that's the value of this function capital F at that point x. Now, the first fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that this function is the antiderivative 
for the function little f, i.e. that it is differentiable everywhere on the interval a, b, and that its derivative f prime evaluated at some point inside the interval is then back equal to the initial function little f evaluated at that point x. So put that to one side for a moment, we'll come back to it. I now want you to consider this integral. So it's an integral over the interval cd now, and it's of this function here. And my claim is going to be that this integral is actually equal to the value of our initial integral, and we're going to show that. So the function that we're integrating is f composed with g of t times g prime of t. So let's consider those two parts. Firstly, f composed with g. So f composed with g means do g first and then do f, and it's going to be a function from the interval cd to the real line. Let's understand that. So the function g maps from the interval cd to the interval ab. So anything inside here is going to be firstly mapped into the interval ab, and then the function f maps from the interval ab to the real line. So it's then going to be mapped into the real line. So yes, that seems good. And this function is also going to be continuous everywhere over that interval. Why is that? Because both of the two bits that it's built out of are continuous. So g is differentiable everywhere over the interval cd, so differentiability implies continuity, so everywhere at this interval g is going to be continuous, and then we know that the function f is continuous everywhere over the interval ab, so at whatever point g maps you onto, you're going to be then continuously mapped onto the point in the real line. So overall, we know that the composite of two continuous functions is also continuous, so this is therefore going to be continuous over the entire interval cd. Then let's look at the function g prime. We've already considered that function, in fact. We said that the function g was continuously differentiable, ergo g prime was continuous over the entire interval cd. Now why is this very helpful? Because we now know that this function here is continuous over the interval cd, and this function here is also continuous over the interval cd. So the function that you get from producting those two continuous functions together is also continuous everywhere over the interval cd, and therefore is going to be integrable. So this integral is going to exist. So we know now that this function is integrable over the interval cd. So this integral exists. What we now want to do is show that it's equal to the value of this integral. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The second fundamental theorem of calculus, remember, says that if it is the case that you know the integrand is integrable and you know that the integrand is itself the derivative of another function over that interval cd, i.e. that the integrand has an antiderivative everywhere over the interval cd, then the value of the integral is guaranteed to be the value of the antiderivative evaluated at the upper bound minus the value of the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. So we need to think about whether this function has an antiderivative over the interval cd. So I now want you to consider this function here, which is the function big F composed with little g, and my claim is that this is going to be the antiderivative for this function everywhere over the interval cd. So let's firstly just study this function. So it means first do little g, so it's therefore going to have domain, the interval cd, which is the domain of the function little g, and then apply the function big F. So let's make sure that this is well defined firstly. So any point on the interval cd is going to be mapped into the interval ab by the function g, and then the function big F is defined on the interval ab, and it's a real valued function. So any point on this interval ab, this is what the function big F will carry it to. So overall, any point inside this interval is going to be mapped onto some value in the real line, and for a given x, this is what it's being mapped onto. Firstly, map it onto g of x, and then take big F of g of x. Now, this function, I claim, is going to be differentiable everywhere over that interval cd, and that its derivative is going to equal this. How do I know that? Well, I know it by the chain rule. The function g, remember, is differentiable everywhere over the interval cd. I also know by the first fundamental theorem of calculus that big F is differentiable everywhere over the interval ab, and that the value of its derivative is little f. So I'm composing two differentiable functions together, so by the chain rule, for every point inside here, 
this function is going to be differentiable. And the chain rule does more than that. It tells us what the derivative is actually going to be equal to. It's going to be equal to the derivative of big F evaluated at g of x. Now, the derivative of big F is little f. So little f evaluated at g of x times the derivative of g evaluated at x, so g prime of x. And this is, of course, this function that I've got here. So this function, big F composed with g, is a function defined over the entire interval cd, and it's a real value function, and it's differentiable everywhere, and the derivative is then this function, which is defined over the interval cd, and which I'm trying to integrate here, and which I already know is integrable. So this function does have an antiderivative, and it's equal to this function. Therefore, since I know it's already integrable, by the second fundamental theorem of calculus, I can conclude that the value of this integral is this function evaluated at d minus this function evaluated at c. So writing this out, this integral is equal to big F evaluated at g of d minus big F evaluated at g of c. Now, I know what g of d and g of c are. g maps c onto a and g maps d onto b. So just substituting those in, I get that this is equal to big F evaluated at b minus big F evaluated at a. Now, here is the definition then of big F. So big F evaluated at b, put b in there, and we get that that's the integral from a to b of f of t dt minus big F evaluated at a is the integral from a to a of f of t dt, which is zero. So I get minus zero here. So this is just equal to the integral from a to b of f of t dt, i.e. it's equal to my initial integral. So that then is the integration by substitution formula, that this integral here is equal to this integral here. So if you have a function f that's continuous over an interval, and you're trying to integrate it over that interval, then one strategy that you can do is create another function, g, that's mapping from a new interval cd into your interval ab, such that the lower bound of this new interval is mapped onto the lower bound of your original interval and the upper bound of your new interval is mapped onto the upper bound of your original interval and if this function g is continuously differentiable then it will hold true that the integral you're after is equal to this integral and you will have experience of this technique from calculus sometimes it's the case that you have no idea what the value of this integral is going to be but when you look at the value of this integral it's much more obvious and hence you can get the answer to an integral that initially you didn't know the answer to with this technique.